Thank you very much, Ed. It's a pleasure for me to be introduced by a individual that's uh, Irish, family of 11 children, and he worked his way through school. He's turned out all right, hasn't he? I think he's, pre I'm pretty impressed. So uh, I am, um, I'm Irish too, so I guess that's why I'm so favorably disposed to Ed, and uh, I wish him well and thank him for his leadership. I also thank Ann. Uh, Ann is here and she is uh, coordinating this effort and it's uh, a wonderful thing for me to get a chance to speak to what I call a, a bunch of doers, individuals that uh, put in their, their profession, their companies, and uh, doing what is necessary to improve the quality of health and the lives of people all over America. I just, uh, I just returned from uh, France last week where I spoke to uh, 26 health ministers from all over Europe. And they wanted me to talk about uh, health care in the United States. I was amazed, ladies and gentlemen, that of all the health ministers all over Europe, they have the same problems as we do. You know, they have a government-controlled system, and they're looking at ways to change it and fix it and make it better. It's too costly. They don't know how to innovate. They don't know uh, how to get the, the best out of their federal dollars. And, they wanted to look to America. They'll never adopt our system, but the truth of the matter is, everybody in America said, well, we, not everybody, but some people would say, if you adopt a European system, we'd be so much better off. The truth of the matter is, they're looking at us, because their problems are just as severe and as complex as ours. I also just returned three weeks ago from Rwanda, where I was out in the bush in Rwanda, and we were able to administer to five million uh, children and mothers all over, all over the uh, uh, country of Rwanda. The biggest undertaking ever of a medical adventure headed up by the government of any country in the world, including China. And we touched five million people. And we were able to deworm five million children in Rwanda, thanks to the pharmaceutical industry of, a, of the world, and especially the United States. I know the pharmaceutical industry gets uh, accused of, uh, of not doing enough, but I'm here to tell you I was there in the field administering drugs from companies here that are represented in this room, and we hit five million children, people that have never seen a doctor before, have uh, parasitic worm problems, and uh, we were able to administer them, and it was really a, a wonderful undertaking for me to see what can be done. I tell you those things because you know, we got so many problems facing us, you know. You, you wake up and whoever thought, you know, that we would be borrowing $10 billion a, a month to fight a war in Iraq? Whoever thought that we would be $9 trillion in debt to the Chinese? Who would have ever thought that the government was going to take over Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac? Whoever thought that the Lehman Brothers would file bankruptcy? And who ever thought that Merrill Lynch would not be a standalone company? Nobody. If anybody would have predicted this a year ago, somebody would have thought that you were smoking something that was not legal. <laughs> Isn't that true? And you look at this and then uh, you say to yourself, wow, is it even pay you to get up in the morning? Because today we're looking at whether or not the largest insurance company in the world is going to be able to sustain itself and continue operation. I tell you that because, you know, we're in some, we're in some rough times. But me personally, I am excited. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about the future of health care. I want to tell you about the problems, but I want to also tell you how optimistic I am about the future. I'm one of those believers, you know, I come from Elroy, Wisconsin. Elroy, Wisconsin is so small, ladies and gentlemen, that you can call somebody, get a wrong number, and still talk for a half an hour. That's, that's my hometown. You know, you have to be optimistic, you know, just to get up in the morning and be able to continue on. And I didn't know I was poor until I went away to the University of Wisconsin and in my paper sack from the Thompson grocery store with my two shirts and one sweater, and everybody else had a suitcase. I was the only one with a paper sack. But you know something? I was optimistic then, and I'm optimistic today. 
I've had, a, I've had a lovely life. I've been 38 years in the government. Can you imagine 38 years in the government? And now I'm out of the government. I'm in the free enterprise system. I'm making money. <laughs> you, know, you know, there are trade-offs. There's trade-offs, you know. In the, in the government, you know, 30, for the last 18 years, 14 years as governor, four years as secretary, I had guards, security, you know, and a driver. And in my last day in office, uh, a little over three years ago, my security and my drivers wanted to take me out for my last dinner, my last supper. And of course, being from Wisconsin, it was beer, brats, cheese, and cream. A lot of beer and a lot of brats. And they took me home at midnight. They couldn't work after 12.01, so they had to get me home by midnight. And so the government works. And they dropped me off, gave me the keys to my car and my house, gave me a tearful embrace and said I was the best secretary they ever worked for. I'm sure they said they say that to everybody, but it makes me feel good. I waved goodbye, they took off, and I went to bed. I got up the next morning, got in the back seat of the car. <laughs> Trade-off number one, I had to learn how to drive. You had to get in the front seat and turn the key on it. I had forgotten to do that. Then I had to go out, I had to go down to Duke University to talk about the future of healthcare, my first day off. And always before, I had one of my guards, one of my security call the airport, and they'd come out and meet me, give me my tickets, and escort me through. I called, got out there, nobody showed up. <laughs> I had to learn how to do an e-ticket, you know, something you've done all the time. I never did it before, I learned to do an e-ticket. Then I had the privilege of standing in line to get my shoes x-rayed. You know, what an indignant experience. I felt just like I was Rip Van Wick and went to sleep four years ago and woke up and said, what the hell's happened to my country? Well, we know what's happened to our country. But what's happening to our country right now is even, even more scary. And we have to fix it. We have a presidential election that's uh, going to be held in about 50-some days. It's going to be very close. Nobody can predict right now. It's going to be down to about eight states, Florida, Virginia, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Minnesota, possibly Colorado. Those well, states going to determine who's the next president. You know, it's amazing it gets down to that much, but that's where it's going to be. Eight, those eight states are going to determine who the next president is. And then when you look at it, you're going to say, you know, hmm, what's going to happen? Who's going to get elected? Well, no, I can't tell you, and you can't, and you can't tell me. Nobody can predict right now. We'll have a pretty good idea. You know, because of polling and everything else come uh, five days before the election. But right now, it's a toss-up. Either side could win. How does that affect health care, where you and I come from? Well, I, I had the privilege of being Secretary of Health and Human Service. What a great opportunity. What a great privilege. You know, I did got involved with more things than any secretary I ever had before. As soon as I got there, we had a shortage of smallpox, and we got hit by 9-11. Then we had anthrax. Then we had, uh, you know, uh, monkey pox. Remember that? Then we had SARS. Then we had the overhaul of Medicare. We started Part D using a competitive approach. I had all of those in four years. I should have got double the money, but I only got paid as that everybody else did. And so, and then I looked at healthcare. And I've, I've done a, you know, I've done a lot of study on healthcare. And, I found out, you know, in the Department of Health and Human Services, we spend $725 billion. Now, if I would ask any of you, you know, who, what department spends the most money, 99% of you would say what? The Department of Defense, wouldn't you? And you'd be wrong. Health and Human Services spends more money. We spend 23 cents out of every federal dollar goes to the Department of Health and Human Services. Department of Defense only spends 18 cents. They're pikers compared to us. But I think, you know, when you look at the future of America, you want to put money where health and human services, where you're going to be able to help your fellow citizen improve, improve their lot. And then you take a look at, at health care, something that, you know, the future of health care, which is, you know, really near and dear to each of us. I happen to love health care. And I applaud all of you because you're in it. And you have to be in it because that's where 16% of the gross national product. It, it doesn't take too much uh, brain power to realize if you want the action, go where health care is. That's the future, 16%.
We spend $2.4 trillion, and by the year 2015, which is what, seven years from now? It's going to go to $4.6 trillion to 21% of the gross national product. You know something, ladies and gentlemen? We can't afford that. We can't afford it because our economy will not be competitive. As I've said, we already owe the Chinese $9 trillion. And we already have seen what healthcare is doing to some of our major corporations, like the automobile industry. General Motors. General Motors used to be one of the five largest companies in the world. Today, General Motors has a market cap the same as they had in 1954. They're a small company. And General Motors may or may not make it. General Motors is no longer the largest automobile manufacturer or seller in the world. Toyota is. And Ford is dropping precipitously as well. And one of the biggest reasons is health care. General Motors is, pays five and a half, five and a half billion dollars a year on health care. More than what they pay for steel. And now they want the federal government to bail them out. I don't think they should. I do not believe that General Motors should get bailed out by the federal government. But I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a conservative. I don't believe that, you know, they've, they brought it on themselves. They've produced cars that people don't buy. They've given it away to the unions to such an extent that they're almost bankrupt. And now they want the federal government to come in and give them an infusion of $50 billion. You know, if you believe in the free enterprise system, which I do, you make dumb mistakes, you live with them. But that's, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a sort of a, a kind of classic conservative to not believe that the, that the federal government should be involved in, in uh, bailing out companies.